Chapter 42 Into Fire and Darkness Stay out. The plants kill. You. As if in a trance, Velvet Remedy took a step towards the weeping willow with its buttery yellow bark and draping pink leaves. It's you. The, cheese, the tree creaked and groaned, an eerie wind blowing through the curtains of hanging pink, rustling them with a mournful whisper. The soft and airy whisper caught my imagination. I could almost believe the wind carried words. Stay away. Velvet Remedy moved slowly closer. It is you, isn't it? She intoned in a struggled voice. She sounded like she was on the verge of breaking or screaming. I picked myself up off the grass and looked at my EFS compass, hoping to spot the whereabouts of my friends, but saw nothing. My eyes forward sparkle had gone down in the crash, or had I never brought it up. The fatal explosion of the Sky Bandit was still ringing in my ears, and I wasn't thinking straight. Zenith, crouching low, her belly against the grass, crept up to the stone bunny. She reached out a tentative hoof and touched it, her hoof pulling back instantly as if she had reached out to touch molten lava. The fierce stone bunny statue remained a fierce stone bunny statue. I brought up my eyes forward sparkle. It flashed a notice to me. New transmission detected. My eyes fell onto the compass, which was glowing entirely red. It was as if the entire forest was hostile. Behind me, I heard Calamity call out. Reggie, there you are. You seen Laugh Bloom? No, Reggie called back, her tone just a little snide. Ain't he the one with the invisibility cloak? Zenith reached out and nudged the statue. It wobbled and fell over. Her eyes widened and she leapt back defensively. The wind picked up. The rustling through the leaves was a haunting sound. It made the weeping willow sound like it was sobbing. How... how can this... be you? Velvet asked, her voice almost childlike now. Zenith stood up, approaching the fallen bunny statue. With a strangely sad look on her face, she leaned her head down and picked it up in her teeth setting it back upright. Doom Bunny, she had said finally. Turn to stone by a cockatrice. A worthy end for a worthy opponent. Only a cockatrice can reverse its own magic, I remembered. The one who had stoned Fluttershy's pet had surely died, if only of old age, lifetimes ago. He had stood guard here, unmoving, unwavering stone. Zenith bowed to Angel. Doom Bunny, forever Fluttershy's protector. The wind picked up, seeming to tear at the tree. The ghostly moans of his branches filled with misery and infinite sorrow. I'm here, Lapbloom called out, appearing as he shook the hood back from his head. Is every pony all right? Yeah, thanks for asking, snarked the griffin. The twisted buttery yellow tree creaked. The blue vines shifted about its gnarled roots. Once more, the soft, painful howl of the wind seemed to form words. Get away. Velvet Remy took a step closer. Get away, Zenith yelled, charging at Velvet Remedy and striking her with a forehoof hard enough to send her tumbling several yards down the sloped clearing. Blue vines erupted from the ground in a shower of dirt and grass. Lashes of twisting, sinister ivy flailed around their victim. One of the blue vines brushed Zenith. Suddenly, there was so much blood. The zebra's body seemed to explode in sick gouts of hot crimson. It was as if each of her stripes had been flensed off her body, leaving gaping wounds of blood and meat. The vines went after Velvet. Zenith collapsed with a wet thump and a barely audible moan, bleeding to death in a growing pool of dark red. I had no time to think, 
I acted instinctively. In desperation, drawing on the darkest strings of power. Zenith's blood pulled itself from the grass, dripping upwards, swirling. I could almost form a blade. And I could form a cast. I spun the blood around her, hardening it into a full body cast, leaving only her flayed muzzle exposed so that she could breathe. Killing joke, she moaned weakly. Stay away. The zebra, who had saved Velvet Remedy's life, slipped into unconsciousness. Now that the unearthly dread had seemed to permeate the forest, I had something in my mind to attach to. The fear became palpable, suffocating. Scholared energy enveloped Velvet Remedy, lifting it from the grassy floor as more vines tore up from the ground, seeking to touch. The vines which had attacked Zenith turned their attention towards me. For just a moment, I froze. I stared at the withering wave of blue as it whipped across the clearing. I could hear gunshots, not calamity. I knew the sound was battle saddle. He knew better than to try to kill Ivy with a bullet. Reggie then, quick to act and unwilling to hold back. Joke Blue's a funny name. How'd she get that? Birth defect, Hamjin told me solemnly. Her mother was hit by killing Yoke, or killing Joke, while pregnant. Lucky either of them lived. Zenith had seen the threat and understood it. Sometimes, I feel as if I'm an earth pony and that my stripes are great wounds. The plant had somehow taken some random thing Zenith had said and turned it against her. Suddenly, I understood the plant's name. It was a joke. A sick, twisted, malevolent joke. The Everfree Forest was home to a mobile, aggressive, sadistic plant filled with transformation magic. Vines of blue struck through the air and slithered across the ground, cladding against a field of shimmering light that interposed itself between me and them. Velvet Remedy's shield spell. The vines struck at the shield, unable to penetrate, then burrowed into the ground again. What have I said? I asked myself in mounting horror. After Arbru, I thought of myself as a monster. Did I ever say that aloud? Does it matter if killing joke? If I did? Oh, Celestia. Did I ever call myself heartless? Lil Pip! Velvet Remedy screamed. The smoky air went a funny scarlet and filled with sparkles. Mike, it was looking like I was looking at the world through a red balloon, dusted with glitter. I felt myself lose weight, the grass dropping from beneath my hooves. I looked down in time to see the blue ivy burst through the grass I had just been standing on, grass that was rapidly sinking away from me. Life Bloom started to run, his horn glowing with scarlet energy, as he galloped back into the forest, meditating Velvet Remedy, me, and the body of Zenith in front of him. Velvet extended her shield spell into a sphere around us. Pyrelight flew overhead, keeping pace as she waved or weaved beneath the tree branches that clawed at her. Hell of a thing you did back there, little pip. Lightbloom called up to me, an in indefiable tone in his voice. He jumped a fallen log, covered in mounds of blackish-green moss. The ground beneath the log tore open, vines of blue wrapping around it, reaching. What kind of spell was that? A last resort, I told him, as Velvet Remedy wasted no time in mummifying Zenith with healing bandages. Blood poured from the zebra's muzzle. Velvet's eyes were brimming with tears. More blue vines tore up the ground ahead of us, lashing themselves between trees like a web. I got this, Reggie shouted, sh shooting forward. She had hold her holstered her pistols and was holding Cage's hellhound claw knives in her talons. Panic shot through me. No, I cried out. Don't let them touch you. My heart skipped a beat as the talon griffin drew up short. Let me, I called out, wrapping her brother's weapons in my magic. Reggie nodded, releasing the blades content to let my magic guide her brother's contribution to our survival. 
The knife soared through the air at my control, slashing apart the blue vines, clearing the way. Life Bloom charged past the shredded barrier, jumping over several strands of blue ivy. All of us were gnarled, wicked trees and bizarre hued plants. Some of the trees were covered in bulging masses of blackish mold, which often looked and took on terrifying silhouettes. But I had ignored these, keeping my eyes trained for crawling strings of hateful blue. I hadn't seen Killing Joke before. Or I had. I mean, there were dead strands of it in Fluttershy's bedroom. This stuff was everywhere in the forest. Everywhere. But the Killing Joke was worst, I suspected. Back in the clearing we were fleeing from. That place was a trap. And Fluttershy. For I was now convinced that the butter yellow weeping willow was indeed the mayor of the Ministry of Peace. Was its lure. And more hellishly, its victim. Did Fluttershy ever say something about being tree-like? Or maybe joked about having a bark worse than her bite? Fuck, maybe she just said she wanted to leave. Dark branches whipped past us. The smoke was getting thicker. Life boom clothed, slowly, as a change in the wind brought rose, rolling waves of heat. As we headed towards the fire, I could see the bright flickers of orange between the thick trees in the depths of the forest ahead of us. We can't go this way, Reggie called out, as I floated ni Cage's knives back to her. Life Bloom started to change direction. Three plumes of black cloud shot past us overhead. Lightning crackled across the smoky contrails. I watched as the Wonderbolts flew past us, then split apart and started back. Ah, hell! Calamity moaned, kicking the lever on his battle saddle to switch ammunition. Least stealthy assassins ever. Only, they weren't assassins, were they? No pony had ever called them that, except for the pony in my head, and she was trying to force them into the wrong frame. No, the Wonderbolts weren't stealthy, but then, when had the Enclave ever been subtle? Stealth was not the Enclave's way. Everything we had witnessed pointed to the Enclave operating under a signal, a single, overriding military philosophy. Shock and awe. Overwhelming displays of power and dominance. Spectacular and terrifying displays of force and skill that paralyze, demoralize, and rout the enemy. The Enclave may have rejected Rainbow Dash, but they were still born out of the fighting force she had molded into her own image. And the Wonderbolts were their greatest and most glorified hunters. Not because they operated with a different mythology than the rest of the Enclave, but because the Enclave revered shock and awe, and the Wonderbolts were the best at it. They were running us to ground, weakened us before the kill, trying to make us panic. The smoke was like tiny daggers in my eyes. Life Bloom coughed again, a bad rattle in his throat. I couldn't keep running much longer, and we couldn't not run the Wonderbolts anyway. But the idea of fighting them in this accursed forest seemed more insane every minute. And the forest wasn't done, not by a long shot. The wonderful bolts were being forced low by the smoke, flying at treetop level. They could trace my tag, but that wouldn't help them track any of the rest of us. And even their armor's targeting spells were virtually worthless in the Everfree Forest. At any distance, my companions just melted into a sea of red lights that was our entire damned environment. Three Wonderbolts were moving closer, now. Enough so that I could make out the ponies in the heads of those contrails. They wore modified versions of the Enclave's standard magically powered armor, their manes flowing out in a trench in the back of their helmets, their muzzles visible through transparent breathing masks. The rest of the armor had the familiar carapace design, only theirs was a deep blue with lightning-like gold filigree. 
Life Bloom poured himself into running, trying to put as much distance between us and the killing joke clearing. The three Wonderbolts, three, weren't there five, had nearly reached us when dark forms burst from the treetops between us. They were reptilian, like miniature dragons, with leathery, leathery wings and wicked claws, and strange, beaked heads, with red eyes that glinted in malice. One of them flew right at one of the Wonderbolts, like it was playing chicken. The elite Enclave fire, Flyer didn't flinch, didn't veer off. Neither did the creature. But at the last moment, instead of the two colliding, the thundercloud contrail stopped, the Wonderbolt falling out of the sky as the creature flew past, turned to stone. Cockatrices. Jet! One of the other Wonderbolts cried out in unison. The fiery maned lead Wonderbolt didn't miss a beat, flipping around in the air and landing on her own contrail, the force causing the smoke cloud to unleash a blast of lightning at the cockatrice. The creature released a wretched, ear-splitting squawk and retreated, trendles of black smoke wafting from its singed scales. Four more had launched from the trees. I heard Calamity fire his rifles, and another monstrous cry as his target dropped to the ground, thrashing and bloodied. A second rounded back on Calamity, only to be knocked away by a flash of emerald and gold. Pyrolite dug her talons into her scaly, dangerous prey, and breathed balefire. I floated a healing potion out of velvet saddlebags, and gingerly tried to pour it down Zenith's throat. Her mouth was full of blood. Her healing bandages were streaked with blackening crimson, where my blood cocoon had cracked and split. The leading Wonderbolt shot overhead, her rust-colored mane whipping in the wind. As she passed us, she spun around, flying backwards. Streams of pinkish light tore from her battle saddle, slashing through the trees and underbrush. Several beams of her magical energy struck against Val Remedy's shield, causing rippling patterns that reminded me of the sky over Canterlot in the Butterfly Orb. Velvet's spell collapsed under the strain, but we were once again too deep under tree cover for the Pegasus to finish any of us off. With the shield down, we were blanketed by the ominous crackling and heat of the fires ahead. Reggie had her guns out, firing bullets at two of the cockatrices simultaneously. Her shots finished with the one Calamity had wounded, and winged another that was circling towards the Wonderbolts. Reggie swung her other gun towards that cockatrice as well, but she was denied the kill. The monster's head exploded, its blood misting in the air. Blam! The shot didn't come from any one of us, nor any of the Wonderbolts we could see. The Enclave's premier sniper was one of the two Wonderbolts hanging back. Out of sight, but still very much in the action. The cockatrice wrestled with pyrelight, twisting and thrashing, trying to turn around so it could look the Balefire Phoenix in the eyes. Pyrelight's talons scraped against its scales, unable to cough, claw through the monster's tough hide. Once again, I wish Steel Hooves was with us. The former Steel Ranger would have made us all... made us a real challenge for the Wonderbolts, and he would have made short work of the killing joke. I suspect he would have enjoyed the opportunity to avenge one of Applejack's closest friends. Velvet Remedy cast her shield about us again, sweat beating on her brow. The strain was getting to her, which was exactly what the Wonderbolts wanted. I saw tears streaming down her cheeks, that probably weren't from the struggling, but from the stinging smoke. Damn it! We need to stop running and start fighting them! I called over the sounds of fighting and fire. Divide and save, remember? We need to go back, Velvet Remedy announced. What? Life Bloom called back, echoing my own thoughts. Go back into the field of transformative torture and death? Velvet turned to me, her tear-soaked eyes filled with determination and pleading in equal measure. We have to save her. Save who? Oh! My eyes widened as I realized just who Velvet Remedy needed to save. The music of magical energy discharges 
wrenched my attention upwards. As we passed between trees, I caught a glimpse of Calamity, Pegasus fighting with the fiery maned Wonderbolt. Scorch marks covered Calamity's barding and his battle saddle, and his left hind leg was curled up under him like I was in pain. But the Enclave Elite had yet to con uh, consummate a fatal shot. She was an excessively better flyer, sweeping rings around him, anticipating his every pitch and yaw. But the forest played havoc with sats, and without his armor's targeting spell, she was nowhere near Calamity's caliber of marksmanship. Fortunately for the Wonderbolts, Calamity didn't want to kill her. I knew he was just trying to draw her away from the rest. Somewhere where Velvet Remedy or Life Bloom could strike her down with a spell. A flying ball of thrashing scales and feathers shot through the forest past us. The cockatrice finally managed to pull itself free from Pyrolite, twisting around to turn its petrifying stare into Pyrolite's face. Pyrolite let out a blast of balefire, melting the creature's eyes away and boiling its brains. I was trying to pour a second healing potion into Xena's mouth. Her muzzle had stopped bleeding, scabbing over like a skin of dark crimson leather. Her breathing was ragged, but less so, I thought, than a moment ago. The ground exploded underneath life bloom. Horrifying, pain-soaked memories of Steelhu's death flashed through my mind as the hellhound erupted from the ground beneath life bloom. The hellhound's timing was a fraction off, his helmet slamming into life bloom's underbelly, thrusting the horn or the unicorn upwards as the hellhound's huge claws slashed at empty air. Life bloom's magic imploded, dropping us as the pony rolled down the back of the hellhound's armored vest, collapsing on the broken ground behind him, stunned. I lashed out with my own telekinesis, enveloping Xena's unconscious form, keeping her from hitting the ground even as I slammed into a nest of fronds on the forest floor. One of the plants slapped me across the eyes. I winced, one eye closed from the pain, and pivoted to look back. The hellhound blinked in surprise, taking a moment to realize what had gone wrong, then spun around, lifting his claws above the staggering unicorn. Blossoms of red spouted from the hellhound's chest, neck, and just below his right eye, as Reggie swooped up behind him, firing both her calamity-crafted guns as fast as the triggers would allow. Each armor-piercing round punctured the hellhound's armor and hide, only three managing to escape. The hellhound fell. Xena's body had come down on the ferns in front of me, but gently, thanks to my magic. I didn't know where Velvet Remedy had landed. The crack of the Wonderbolt sniper split the sky. I hoped the Pegasus would be aiming at a cockatrice. Three more helmeted hellhounds tore themselves up from the ground about ten yards away and began charging towards us, looping on all fours, magical energy rifles strapped to their backs. I felt the earth tremble beneath me. Ground might tremble a bit. That's all the warning you'll get before they rend you apart. My heart stopped. There was a hellhound right beneath me. I wasn't dead yet. In the time it took me to think that, I should have been. Lifebrim shook himself off and began running towards me. I thought I heard Velvet Remedy doing the same. Overhead, Pyrolite had abandoned her kill and was circling through the trees, looking for her favorite unicorn. Ghosts don't exist, just landmines. That was Dixie Dew's belief about the supposed haunted farm. In a flash, I remembered the Hellhound's tactic at Maripony, but it was a reason the other three Hellhounds had revealed themselves so far away. Stop! I shouted. Stay back! Mines! I wrapped a levitation field around myself and Zenith. The three Hellhounds stopped in their charge, ducking behind trees as they drew their weapons. Life loomed through the hood of the zebra cloak over his head, vanishing. Little Pip, don't! Reggie squawked. If you move, you'll set them off! Purple light speared my reinforced cantalot barding, knifing into my flank. The armor dispersed most of the magical energy, but that didn't stop me, the searing pain. Physical hurt gave way to something deeper, as I realized the shot had struck my cutie mark, possibly doing permanent damage. I wailed. 
I never loved my cutie mark, but the idea that I might have just lost it, even on just one of my flanks, was an excruciating cut to my soul. It was all I could do to keep from stripping off my armor to see what damage the Hellhound's shot had done. With a voice filled with emotion, I screamed back at Reggie. We can't stay here. We don't need to hold still. We need to move very, very fast. Just keep the two of you weightless, Reggie shouted back as she drove behind a rock, taking cover from incoming Hellhound fire. I'll shoot by and grab you the moment. Brilliant blast of light from above snatched everyone's attention, making the smoky sky seem to glow. A rust-colored heap with an orange tail plummeted into a nearby tree, trailing smoke. Calamity! Velvet Remedy shrieked. Pyrolite winged over, zeroing in on her voice. A black, scorched reptilian monster launched itself at Pyrolite from a nearby tree. The Balefire Phoenix jerked around to see her attacker, and immediately turned to stone. The stone phoenix dropped. Velvet cried out in despair. Reggie spun in the air, taking swift aim. Only a cockatrice can reverse its own magic. No! I bellowed, my voice rasping from the smoke. Don't kill it! We need it alive! The last word was disrupted by a fit of coughing. Three down. We were losing this. Four down, if you counted the little pony in my head, who could do nothing more than prance around in mercy, crying, My cutie mark! My cutie mark! The cockatrice dripped, or dipped a wing, circling back through the trees towards us. As it came in sight, the monster was struck by a blast of magic from Velvety's horn. It lost control of its body, smacking into a tree branch. The limb body slid from the branch, dropping into a purple fern. One of the hellhounds kept firing, pinning Reggie as two others moved to closer trees. Then they opened fire while their companion left cover. The ground squirmed beneath them. A tendril of bright blue wormed out of the forest floor, wrapping itself around the ankle of the last hellhound. The hellhound was gone. His helmet and rifle dropped into the underbrush. In his place stood a stunned, blinking earth pony mare. Her flowing purple mane cascading over her pristine pearl white coat. She has no cutie mark, my little pony fixated on. The earth pony let out a wide eyed meep. The other hellhound spun to see the pony, who had apparently snuck up behind them. With unthinking aggression, they jumped at her, claws flashing. With thoughtless instinct, I telekinetically shoved the new pony backwards. The two hellhounds collided, almost comically. Seeming to grasp at least some part of her situation, the pony spun around and galloped into the forest, crying. The two hellhounds picked themselves up and gave chase. More vines of blue tore themselves from the ground, trying to reach them, but the hellhounds were too fleet of foot to be snagged. I blinked. My mind conjured the image of the hellhound casually commenting to his brothers, Sometimes, I wish I was a pony, or something like that. I could see the joke. It was almost comical. Ha ha, we got your family to murder you. Almost comical, yet still fucking sick. Birth defect. Killing joke had attacked the mother of Homage's closest friend when she was pregnant. Probably killing her, and forever scarring the unborn baby. The filthy notion settled in my head as the plants probably did the same, or did something, that caused the mother to die during childbirth. Murdering her on what should have been her happiest day, and stealing Joke Blue's mother from her forever. I realized I hated those plants. Not just feared them, loathed them, with spectacular intensity. I felt myself yanked away, Reggie's talons digging at my barding, Zenith in her other claw, grip, being held in her saddle pouch. The ground shot beneath me in a blur just before I was, before it erupted into a paroxysm of melted magical energy. Reggie set us down a dozen yards beyond the magical firestorm. Life Bloom appeared almost immediately, his horn glowing as he began to cast medical spells over Zenith. I realized 
We had completely lost track of the Wonderbolts. This is bad, I moaned. Where are they? Why weren't they pressing their assault? You will fix her, Valdemar growled, threatening to strangle the barely conscious cockatrice wrapped in her magic as she thrust it towards a pyrelite shaped stone half embedded in the forest floor. The cockatrice let out a plaintive squawk. Pyrelite's body slowly became flesh and feathers again. The stone seemed to wash away. Don't you let that rascal go. Tommy dropped out of his tree with a groan. His coat was singed and burned away in places, revealing red and blistered skin. His hat was half burnt. The remains of his mane were still smoldering. My dearest friend was in agony. My nerves cried out in sympathetic pain at the sight. I covered my mouth as I gasped. Fucker weaponized the buccaneer blaze. Clement complained through gritted teeth as Velvet galloped to him, giving the suspected minefield as little of a berth as she thought safe. The cockatrice hauled behind her. The heat from the fires was oppressive against my own coat and flesh. I couldn't imagine how much it was aggravating Calamity's wounds. Gingerly, as if stepping closer to him would cause more pain, I approached Calamity. Are you... I stopped before asking Equestria's dumbest question. Instead, I turned to Velvet. Will it be alright? The charcoal unicorn was pulling out a super restoration potion. One of our last. Part of me wondered if Zenith might need that more. A much bigger part of me wanted to beat that part of me up for even asking. I had to trust Velvet and assume that Life Bloom had healing spells that likely put our own potions to shame. Reggie landed next to us. No sign of our pony-feathered friends, she commented. But the fire line's less than a hundred yards ahead, and Red Eyes Griffins are leading it. My guess, the Wonder Bolts are regrouping. Forrest took out one of their own before they could even engage us, so they're probably giving their plan a rethinking before trying us where they could draw Red Eyes forces into the skirmish. Thanks, Celestia. We needed the break even if it was going to be very short-lived. But more than that, we needed to get somewhere safe. The heat was draining our strength almost as much as the fighting. The smoke was burning my eyes and throat, making it hard to breathe. A struggle against the Wonderbolts became a three-way battle, and the Everfree Forest was winning. I really wanted to walk up to them, waving a flag of truce and calling out, Hello, look, I know we both decided to do this thing in the Everfree Forest, hoping we could use the environment against each other and all that, but we were clearly stupid. Think maybe we could call the timeout until we get away from this pony murdering woods? Obviously, that wasn't going to happen. They didn't need help getting out of Everfree Forest. All they had to do was fly up. Hell, if they wanted to, they could probably just wait us out. Maybe that's why we didn't see them anymore. They had figured that out themselves. Fuck. The ground shimmered beneath us. Velvet Remedy had spread her shield spell over the patch of ground beneath all of us, creating a barrier of protection against the killing joke. So far, it hadn't tried to attack us again. Lifebloom suggested that the detonation of the mines might have scared it off, although he didn't put it in those terms. Some of them finding targets by sensing vibrations and whatnot. My own wild theory was that the plant was slithering away from the approaching fire line. The wind had shifted again, blowing the fires away from us, but the flames looked another ten yards closer, and we could occasionally hear the shouts of red eyes, forest burners. Even working against the wind, they'd make flutter tree by nightfall. Those those horrible vines, Velvet Remedy whimpered, holding on to me. I was fighting a strong urge to push her back, strip off my armor, and check my flank. But Velvet needed to be held, and I knew that my cutie mark had been damaged by magical energy. 
No amount of looking was going to help. Velvet was more important. My friends were more important. And I did really want, and did I really want to know. They trapped her up there, high on the hill, where she could watch what happened to her equestria. And it was poisoned, as destroyed. Her tear-filled eyes stared into mine. Pip, they made her watch. I hugged the kind unicorn, who had once been my idol, and who became one of my dearest friends. I couldn't bring myself to mention my own heartbreaking suspicions. That for centuries, the killing joke had used her as bait, luring victims into the clearing and torturing them in front of her. It was intentionally cruel. I was sure of it. How could plants be so vile? They're torturing her. Torturing Fluttershy. Though it buried her head against my neck, I held her, not knowing what else to do. Not far away, a heavily bandaged and medicated calamity was morbidly instructing Reggie to cut the paws off the hellhound she had killed. We might be able to use those claws. Calamity sent a glance our way. He should be the one holding Velvet, not me. But even touching him would cause him searing pain. The thought pulled my attention to the burning of my own flank. A biting pain that I was trying my best to ignore. Further still, Lifebloom was tending to Zenith as best he could. The zebra had yet to regain consciousness, and I heard a sad hoot from Pyrelight. I believed the Balefire Phoenix had come to enjoy being a healer, following in Velvet footsteps. But unlike Ditsy Doo or Steel Hooves, neither Zenith nor Calamity would find their health restored with Pyrelight's radiation on them. Instead, she stood guard over the bound and blindfolded cockatrice, Velvet's prisoner. We have to save her, little Pip, Velvet sobbed, pulling back, shaking me. We have to! I fished for something to tell her. I wanted to save Fluttershed too, but how? If anything, I mean, how do, the, how do you save a tree? If anything, the approaching fires might be a mercy. We'll do whatever we can, I promised her. Leaving quiet to Kavit the not being able to do anything. Lifebloom stood up, staring down at what had, was hardly recognizable as a zebra. She's in bad shape, but she's stable. And that's more than I would have expected. He looked back at me. A last resort of yours saved her life. With a frown, he added, But she's in a coma. At best, it's going to be up to her whether she wakes up. And at worst? Calamity asked. At worst, Lifebloom paused, looking at us, judging how much to say. I have a spell. Think of it as the opposite of Velvet's bone regrowing spell. Several of us nodded. Velvet tensed against me. I may have to use it to relieve the pressure in her skull by dissolving part of it. And unnecessarily, he added, and that's risky. Velvet and I slightly turned our heads to gaze upon Zenith. Her bandages were completely soaked in blood, the crimson life drying into a blackish shade that made her look like a pony-shaped bruise on the earth. My eyes shifted to Velvet. She knew much better than I did what realities hid behind Lifebloom's diagnosis. All I knew was that it was very bad, and we might not have Zenith with us much longer. More than ever, I wanted to see her return home to Glyphmark, to be with her daughter, to help and to aid her tribe, teaching them medicines and survival skills, and a memory flittered through my mind. I halted my train of thought, focusing on it, trying to grasp the fragment of the past that had just shaken loose. Finishing her grisly work, Reggie slammed one of her brother's knives through the shield and into the ground, the claw blade sinking up to the hilt. 
It should be Cage here, not me. Before any of us could misconstrue her statement, she looked up, her face etched with sadness. Cage was better all this fucked up wilderness crap. Regina's voice was damp with nostalgia. Cage actually wanted to study this shit, and I'd have let him have his way. We'd have been on tour to all the most fucked up places of Equestria. Splendid Valley, Canterlot, Whitetail Wood, and of course, the ever-fucked forest. The memory seemed to dissolve, even as my mind grasped for it. I stomped the ground in fury, in, in frustration. I was sure I had been important. Little Pip? Velvet queried. Sighing inwardly at a loss, I turned to Reggie. I... I'm sorry about Cage. The Griffin didn't look at me. You said that already, she said crossly. Whitetail Wood? Velvet Remedy asked, picking up on one name that she hadn't heard before. Asking more for Regina's sake than for her own curiosity. A smirk crossed a, a <clears throat> Reggie's beak. Yeah. Cage used to call it the most poisoned place in Equestria. I think Canterlot is that, Calamity mumbled. He turned to see our Pegasus companion. Half mummified, wind blowing at the trailing strands of gauze. Standing in a patch of fawns. The ponified hellhounds dropped energy rifles, clenched in his teeth. Woof, he said innocently, taking in our stares. It's worth something. I rolled my eyes. Next to me, Velvet Remedy stifled a laugh. Canterlot's unique, Reggie told Calamity. Well, was. Whitetail Wood's poison is just excessive. The adolescent griffin gave the slight, smiling shrug that admitted she didn't really know. That's what Cage said, anyway. The griffin pulled Cage's knife out of the ground, wiping it off and slipping it back into her belt with its twin. Her eyes turned once again to the corpse of the hellhound she had dismembered. Hey, check this out, she called, holding the dead hellhound's helmet in her talons. I slipped away from Velvet. As I approached, I could faintly hear some sort of throbbing hum coming from the helmet. Crap. When I'd first brought up my eyes forward Sparkle, my Pipbuck had notified me to an unfamiliar broadcast. Slipping my ear bloom, I switched to the new frequency. My ear was met with a strange, pulsing hum, throbbing in time to the sound from the helmet. Over the hum there were other notes, an odd chorus of artificial sound that cycled in disharmonious patterns. The underlying oscillation reminded me starkly of the Enclave Array in Old Olney. Lens Flare, also top of his class, focused in Arcano Tech, Clemity had said. The Wonderbolts were using magically laced sound to control Hellhounds. This was the other beat of the Wonderbolts' plan. They knew we were expecting to fight them from above, not below. I told the others what this meant. Then we've got to go back to that farm, Reggie said. Take out the transmitter. Calamity spit out the magical rifle. Or, you know, just take their helmets off. Yes, because they will... will... be free-willed, hyper-aggressive creatures who have just suffered mind control at the hooves of ponies. Light Bloom set out serenely. Far less dangerous. Well, my plan sucked. Again. Clemity shook his head, staring at the grass beneath the shimmering shield. I couldn't wait another minute. Little Pip? Velvet Remedy gasped. What are you doing? Stripping out of my armor, I looked at my cutie mark. That's what I was doing. I'd never gotten undressed so frantically. I bucked away my armored barding, craning my neck to see my flank. No. 
My coat had burned. My flesh had warped and bubbled, dissolving like a corkscrew. The cruel destructive magic energy had pierced my barding just below my cutie mark, devouring nearly half the cute little pit buck on my flank. No. I didn't scream. I felt I should have, but it was like a rusty hook had been plunged into my gut and torn back out, eviscerating my emotions, leaving a gaping black pain that was beyond loss. The feeling wasn't rational. I knew I still had my cutie mark on the other flank, but I couldn't engage that part of my brain. I heard Velrem to gasp. She sounded strangely distant. Gritting his teeth against his own apology, Calamity stepped towards me. Lil Pip, he began, wanting to say whatever the fuck he thought would help. But I swung a hoof at him, making him back away. Don't you dare tell me how cutie marks don't matter, I hissed. Calamity didn't deserve that, but I couldn't push through my own grief, even to care. The wasteland had attacked me, body and soul, carved me up. The taint had twisted me up inside, changing me. I regrew a leg. Then there was my pip leg, and whatever else, whatever else the pink cloud had done to me. But more than that, the wasteland had taken my innocence, my naivety, had sliced away one piece of my soul after another. But this was something it had no right to take. The wasteland couldn't steal from me what made me special, no matter how insignificant that specialness often seemed to be. And an attack on my cutie mark felt like exactly that. Rounding on Velvet, I demanded, Can you fix this? Tell me you can fix this! Velvet swallowed, then sad, shifting her eyes, betraying the truth. Still, she offered, Maybe, if we cut away all the damaged flesh... I willfully ignored those eyes, the look which told me no. Do it, I insisted virtually thrusting my flank in her face. Quickly! The little Pip? No. Velvet tried to be reasonable. Look where we are! I don't care! I snapped. My vision blurred. I realized I was crying. When did that start? Cut it away! Velvet Remedy stood up, her expression shifting to displeased determination. No! She barked back sternly. Not here! Turning away, she informed me. If you want me to cut you up, you're going to have to wait until we're someplace safe, she added, and at least halfway sanitary. I wanted to hit her. I knew it was wrong for me to feel like that, but it was as if all the pain and hollowness had shifted, filtering through the lens at her refusal, becoming rage. Whoa, Reggie said, seeing the change in my demeanor. I rounded on Velvet, lifting my forehoofs as I opened my muzzle to scream at her, give her one more chance to... A flash of magic interrupted me. The pain in my flank disappeared, as did the feeling in my legs, and everywhere else. It was like my body had been dissolving away, leaving me a floating spirit. I didn't even feel myself hit the ground, registering my collapse only as a drop in perspective. Some pony is a timeout, Life Bloom said, his horn glowing. The anesthetic spell. He taught it to Velvet Remedy, hadn't he? Everyone stared at me. I felt even more angry. Now, I wanted to buck even more of them. In the face. With radishes, my little pony suggested bizarrely. Clamity looked away preoccupying himself with strapping a magical energy rifle to his battle saddle. Velvet Remedy leaned down and nuzzled me gently. We're sorry, little Pip. We understand. She gave me an odd but kind look. I know how long you fought to get your cutie mark. To not be upset would be... damaged. She laid down next to me, 
not touching, but giving me the support of her proximity, whether I wanted it or not. My rage and hurt didn't fade, but after a few deep breaths, the focus of my anger began to trickle away from Velvet Remedy and more towards myself. The world became a blur until it was nothing more than watery shapes. I cried into Velvet Remedy's floor shield, the tears crackling softly as they fell. Now then, Lifebloom suggested calmly, having poured healing spells into Zenith and Calamity. My Pegasus friend was moving without pain again. Zenith hadn't stirred. Let's see what we can do about saving this one. My anger had dissolved back into that wounded, hollow feeling. The transition was enough to allow the more rational part of my head to take over. Yes, my cutie mark was gone. Well, gone-ish. But I had never really understood it, or cared for it. It was, after all, not much better than a cutie mark of a cutie mark. And I still had his twin. I felt ashamed. Reggie was dealing with the loss of a real twin, real family, better than I was dealing with the loss of a stupid picture on my flank. I also felt woozy, lightheaded. I was dehydrated. My vision was still blurry, even though I had stopped crying. I couldn't move my forelegs to wipe my eyes. The heat of the burning forest was drying my tears, turning them hot and extra salty. I coughed in the smoke, my throat feeling raw. I wonder how close the flames were now. I couldn't get up to see, but the crackling was louder than ever. It sounded closer. Every forest looked brighter than before, bathed in an unearthly orange glow. And of course, there was a tiny, lingering embarrassment over having laid helpless as Velvet Remedy redressed me. She and Calamity weren't about to let me lie around in the Everfree Forest unprotected. It was not enough for them that I had been armor adjacent. The white pony with the red and scarlet mane turned and pointed his glowing horn back towards the forest. A reddish glow formed somewhere deeper in the forest, beyond where my ground level perspective allowed me to see. The glow intensified as it drew closer. Wrapped in the sparkling red sheath of Lifebloom's magic, the stone statue of Pegasus in Wonderbolt armor floated over to, over the ferns and set down on the shielded ground before us. Jet, they had called her. Damn, Calamity whispered with a resurgence of hope. Maybe his plan was in total wash after all. Velvet Army levitated the bound cockatrice over. Now listen close, she whispered, her voice somehow both kind and menacing. You restore this pony, and you promise not to go around turning innocent creatures to stone, and we'll let you go. Unspoken promises of what would happen should the cockatrice refuse dripped from the offer. Lifebloom lifted the, a questioning eyebrow, mouthing to the others, Let it go? I wanted to chuckle, or at least nod. Lifebloom didn't know our velvet. The ch cockatrice complied, at least regarding the first part. The gray, hard, lifelessness of the stone washed away, leaving the ebony-coated, violet-maned, blue-armored Pegasus blinking in bewilderment. Before the mare could drink in the befuddled change in her environment, Lifebloom stepped forward, lowered his horn towards the Wonderbolt's helmet, lifting up her visor and tucking his horn to her forehead. There was a sparkling red flash. The Wonderbolt's eyes widened as Calamity's memories flooded into her. Somewhere nearby, I heard shouts. Red-Eye's fire brigade was closing into our position. Damn, Calamity muttered again. This time, with disgust. Lifebloom was locked in concentration, casting into the ebony Wonderbolt's head. Velvet Remedy released the cockatrice, which immediately fled with an indignant squawk, its leathery wings propelling it away from the oncoming wall of fire. Virginia took out, took to the air, only to drop back down to the ground almost instantly after clearing the treetops. Uh, Pip squeak? Little Pip, I corrected, 
My name strangely slurred from a muzzle, where I couldn't feel my own tongue. The tag thing the Wonderbolts are following you with. Gotta reckon they have tags for each other, right? I didn't think I liked where Reggie's too casual speculation was heading. What you bet when their own girl down here got unstonified, they got all sorts of signals. Oh fuck. Both Red Eyes forces and the Wonderbolts were going to come down on this spot in minutes. We needed to move. I needed to move. Lifting a hoof would be a good start. The glow around Lapbloom's horn faded. The memory spell complete. Lapbloom staggered back, wiping sweat from his forehead. And Twilight Sparkle could use that at least five times in one day, he said weakly. Jet stood, blinking, shaking herself off. The ebony wonderworld stared at us her eyes wide, her face openly displaying her internal conflict, expressions of confusion, dismay, and revulsion chasing each other across the, her features, the few we could really see. The Wonderbolt mare spread her wings, and, without a word, fled. Well, shocks, Calamity said, staring at the empty space Jet had filled just a moment ago. I reckon I was a silly pony, to hope she'd jump to join our side. She didn't attack us, I pointed out. That's something. Great. Some pony grab your mastermind and your zebra, and let's get out of here, Reggie growled, checking the load on our guns. She watched, launched herself into the air, clearing the treetops and nearly colliding with one of the four Pegasus-tipped thundercloud and contrails that rippled over the sky ahead. Too late. The rust main Wonderbolt cartwheeled in the air as she flew past Regina, firing a spray of pinkish light that bombarded Regina. The light seemed to explode on contact with the Griffin, and Regina crashed back onto the treetops. I found myself engulfed in a magical energy field, the color of Velvet Remedy's Nightingale Cutie Mark. If I lose both my Cutie Marks, the pony on my head moves worthlessly. Will my magic color change? Velvet Remedy floated me off the ground her shielding spell dissipating, and began to run. Lifebloom broke into a gallop behind her, floating Zenith ahead of him. He quickly overtook us, a faster runner than Velvet, and floated Zenith's seem seemingly lifeless body carefully on his Velvet's back as he passed. I saw his red and scarlet tail running in front of us for just a moment, streaming out from beneath his cloak. Then he vanished. I twitched. Lightbloom's spell was fading. I was beginning to feel my body again. I swung my pip leg. My movements less like a pony and more like a ragdoll. The sword that would come with its own notepad and quill, a little voice told me. Fumbling, I marked on my pip buck's auto map where Reggie had fallen. We'd come back for her, I swore, before the day was out. But right now, we were just trying to get some distance between us and the fire. A cloaked figure appeared amongst the trees ahead of us. At first, all I saw was the zebra stealth cloak, and I wondered why Lifebloom had stopped and turned. But the shape under the cloak was all wrong. My heart skipped a beat. The figure rose up, the hood of the cloak falling back to reveal the helmeted head of a white-furred hellhound. He raised his magical energy cannon towards us, aiming down the sight with one of his alien-looking red eyes. A sure sign of Albionism. And touched the trigger. The albino hellhound shot went wild. A crackling ball of unstable energy that arced towards maybe a dozen yards before exploding into an omnidirectional spray of magical flak. As the still invisible life bloom barreled into him, horn first. Even a full gallop, life bloom didn't have the strength to penetrate the toughened hide beneath the hellhound's fur. But his momentum sent the monster flying backwards, tumbling and sprawling. Lifebloom hadn't ended the charge practically graceful either. He was on his back, hood down, and cloak bunched up around his neck, kicking his legs in the air in an embarrassing and almost perverse position. 
The Wonderbolts flew back overhead, spitting off in different directions. The Wonderbolt mare with a rust-colored mane shot straight up. Lifebloom rolled over, struggling to get to his hooves, getting tripped up by the cloak. The albino hellhound was faster, flipping back to his feet and diving for where his magical flat cannon fell. I couldn't move properly, but I was far from helpless. Little Macintosh floated out in front of me, and I took aim at the hellhound through the trusty revolver scope. Without sats, hitting an erratically moving target was damn hard. But I wasn't fresh out of the stable anymore. I had lots of practice. Blam! 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 I missed the hellhound. Two of my shots went completely wild. The third struck his magical weapon just as he was drawing it up. The hellhound was either acting faster than he was thinking, or he hadn't noticed the hit. He aimed the cannon at Velvet Remedy and pulled the trigger. The gun began to crackle, engulfing in a sheath of unstable energy. The hellhound hurled it as far from himself as he could, the magical flat cannon landing on the grove of grotesquely moss-covered trees and purple ferns. It cartwheeled, bouncing through the fawns. Crapow! Flashing blades of solid magic sliced past me. One struck through Velvet's mane, sending tufts of white flying. But blind luck and the forest shielded us. The explosion shredded shovel trees, mercifully claimed no pony lives. Break! shouted Calamity. Scatter! Vilva canted, shifting her gallop into a new direction, drawing me away from the others. I looked back, glimpsing Lifebloom, who had finally made it to his hooves, sprinting the opposite direction. Something blue shot down out of the sky. The forest exploded. The shockwave slammed into me, making my insides feel like jelly, as it picked Velvet and Zenith up off the ground and hurled us all brutally forward. A ring of crackling electric blue smoke followed the shockwave, as did the roar emanating from the mushroom-like cloud that rose up behind us. My whole body felt bruised even before I slammed onto the ground. I thanked the goddesses that Velvet had put my reinforced can Cantalot police body back on. The Wonderbolt shot out of the mushroom cloud, opening fire on her downed opponents. The air between us filled with beams of frantic pinkish light. Biting back a moan, I rolled behind the splintering remains of one of the shredded trees, taking cover. As the Wonderbolt shot past us, I realized, to my dismay, that the explosion hadn't even been a weapon. It was an aerial maneuver. But how? I knew that Pegasi, and possibly even Earth Ponies, had their own inherent magic. Well, duh. Have you met Pinkie Pie? Pegasi could walk on and manipulate clouds, after all. But this was beyond the pale. I was forced to quickly reassess what the best at shock and awe had actually meant. I pushed myself up, coughing wretchedly. My coughs were wet and hot, and tasted like copper. I ran my pip leg over my muzzle, and found myself looking at a screen smeared with blood. Not good.